I'd like to look with you at verse 5, where we read that when Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, although he had nothing in his hand. So at the end of verse 5, we read that a, a young lion came roaring against him. Now after uh, growing up as he did, uh, under the special influence of the Holy Spirit, who was indwelling him in a particular sevenfold fullness, You'll remember that that was demonstrated in his seven locks of hair. So after growing up under that indwelling and influence, the Spirit of the Lord, we read at the end of chapter 13, began to move upon him uh, where he lived in the camp of Dan. That's the remnant of that tribe, the faithful remnant of that tribe. Began to move him probably around the age of 30, which was a common age for people to begin uh, their public ministries. And when the Holy Spirit began to move him like that, it's very clear that uh, Samson is burdened with a sense of his call. And uh, that call is a call that he's been aware of, really, all his life, as uh, something that was destined for him, because uh, his parents had been told told directly by Christ that this child would begin to deliver Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So essentially he is going to be a means of blessing uh, to the church and to liberate her from a worldly and oppressive culture. So he's been aware of that, but at a particular time he becomes deeply conscious that the time is coming. And of course, we then discover that the Lord uh, moves him particularly to the town of Timnah, which is an Israelite town, important to remember that, but it is a border town, just bordering the land of the Philistines, and it has been occupied by the Philistines, who are now oppressing that town. And when Samson goes down to Timnah, uh, the Bible tells us that he goes down as a person looking for an opportunity to overthrow the oppressor. Now, he doesn't know how it's going to happen. I mean, sometimes we have to take things step by step. And very often the Lord doesn't shine a light too far ahead. And he does that so that faith has a greater opportunity to exercise itself. Sometimes he just shines one step ahead, and that's all. So he's going to Timnah, and he is looking, as the Bible says, for an occasion to move against the Philistines. And there's no doubt that the more he sees of the Philistine oppression in Timnah, the more he wants to liberate the people of God. But surprisingly, as we saw, he's actually led, and surprisingly to himself too, he's led to a Philistine woman. And for reasons that we saw last time, he's led to propose marriage to her. Now, his parents object, but they themselves come to see that um, God has a special guidance upon their son. And it's their duty to yield to his judgment as the judge of God, to the judge of Israel, just as it was Christ's parents' duty to yield to himself in a certain sense, in terms of the spiritual guidance, even from an early age. And so his parents accompany him down to Timnah to arrange the marriage. Now, it's obvious on the journey that Samson and his parents, for whatever reason, are separated as they come near to the vineyards of uh, Timnah. Now, <laughs> People who are obsessed with finding fault with Samson, and there are a lot of people who are obsessed with finding fault for, with Samson, and they, and they find fault with virtually everything that's written about him. So that becomes amazing that he's mentioned in the roll call of faith at all. But 
They say that the reason um, things start to go wrong for him immediately is because he's in the vineyards here and he's basically separated himself from his parents because he wants to take grapes, which uh, to me just goes to prove that if you want to find fault, you will always find a reason to find fault. There's no trace that Samson here is wanting to eat grapes or anything of that kind. There may be another significance to the vineyard. I mean, why not turn that round and say that his parents wanted to eat grapes and he, he wasn't particularly in the vineyards. Anyway, just forget about that because none of that is relevant. But what is relevant is that when he comes near to Timna, he is viciously and suddenly attacked by a lion. As the Hebrew emphasis, a young lion, by that it means a lion in its prime. When we speak of things like a, a young lion or something like that, we tend to think of a baby, a baby lion, but that's not what's being conveyed. You're talking about a lion in its prime, which is about a lion, uh, about a lion of about five or six uh, years of age. I mean, lions can live to 15 or maybe 20 years if they're uh, well looked after, but a lion of five or six years is a young lion in its strength. <clears throat> now, when uh, you encounter a lion like that, there's only one winner uh, normally, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, your only chance, you think, may be somehow to run away, but a lion is twice as fast uh, as a person. And uh, a lion is approximately ten times stronger than the average male, three times heavier, its claws are three and a half inches long, and some of its teeth are over two inches long. Uh, nobody comes out of a contest with a lion very well. But as you all know, uh, Samson amazingly fought this lion and won the battle, and he did so too with no weapons in his hand. That's important. Uh, the Bible emphasizes that, that he tore the lion apart just as someone would have torn a young goat apart, though he had nothing in his hand. But he uh, was victorious over the lion through that first great display of strength uh, with which his name, of course, is always attached. Uh, you sometimes used to have strong men who were in circuses and things like that in the past, and they would be called Samson, because, again, this has gone into popular culture, where a strong man may be called Samson. Now, the God who indwelt him uh, with special fullness and called him to Timnah has a reason for allowing this. If Samson is full of the Holy Spirit, if he's going to do good, uh, the last thing you would expect in a way is that he would encounter a problem of this magnitude. Uh, but, well, I'll, I'll touch on that more fully a little later, but that's actually quite common in the things of the Lord. That um, the more full of the Lord you are and the more ready and eager you are to do the Lord's will, the more quick the devil is to come your way. The best example of that is in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. When he is anointed himself with the sevenfold fullness of the Holy Spirit in the Jordan, we're told that immediately the Spirit drove him out to the wilderness where he was to be tempted by the devil. That was God's next portion for him. After filling him up with a special fullness, his next port of call was to be confronted with Apollyon, with the prince of the power of the air, with the god of this world. And the same is true here with Samson. But God has his purpose for allowing this at this time and in this way. And perhaps we need to begin by looking at the lion itself and asking, what is it that the lion really represents in this history? It is a strange history, 
There are lions and riddles, uh, honey, carcasses, bees, and there are spiritual principles behind these things all the time, which may be a little lost on us. But the lion certainly symbolizes itself, the Philistines. You'll notice in verse 5 here that we're told that a young lion came roaring against him, and then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. If you just go quickly forward to chapter 15 and verse 14, What's, what was prefigured there in the lion it comes to fruition when the Philistines attack him. In verse 14, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines, like the lion, came shouting against him. And again, at the same time, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And then you have the unexpected defeat of the Philistines. And that kind of parallelism there just reminds you and reminds us all that the lion is certainly somehow representing the great power of the Philistines that is going to come against him. But there's far more to it than that. <coughs> lions, well, people remark on observing lions that they're obsessed with territory. Uh, male lions seem to exist to acquire territory and to preserve it. They're extremely territorial animals. And that's one reason why ancient cultures used uh, a lion to symbolize certainly their strength and their power, but also um, that this is our territory. And you cannot encroach on it uh, without permission. If you do so, you do so at your peril. Now, you'll find that in history all across the world, really. If you look at ancient Chinese history, they have guardian lions guarding their lands, guarding their buildings. You find that right across Asia, you'll find it into the Middle East, you'll find it here, you'll find it in Egypt. They too have their guardian lions. And you find lions, statues of lions, at the entrances to royal tombs, palaces, and territories. Now the Philistines are cousins of the Egyptians. Uh, historians are, secular historians that is, are a little bit confused as to where the Philistines actually really came from because although there's plenty evidence for their existence, they're not quite sure where they began. But if you go back to the book of Genesis, you'll find their beginnings. You'll find that the grandson of the founder of Egypt was actually the ancestor of the people of Philistia. It's as simple as that. So the founder of Egypt, a man called Mitzrayim, which is the Hebrew name for Egypt. So in Genesis 10, you'll find that, that the ancestor of Egypt is the grandfather of the ancestor of the Philistines. And you'll find them existing together. I mean, you still hear the names of the cities of the Philistines in the news, Gaza particularly, a Philistine city, still in the news. You'll notice it borders Egypt. And uh, there was this close connection between the two. And the lion was a powerful symbol to them of their culture and their determination to preserve their ways and their culture. I suppose that's become well known to us through the famous Sphinx. I don't know if any of you have visited Egypt and the Pyramid of Giza, uh, where the Sphinx is the guardian. Now, the Sphinx is in the shape of the lion, all, all their guardian lions obviously were, but they have the head of the pharaoh. And, and some of their guardian lions had the head of the pharaoh because um, they, they were attaching divinity to this power. Um, pharaoh himself was the representative of the sun god, the sun god was their ultimate deity. Uh, in a way, it's understandable why people should hold the sun in awe if you're not a believer in God because light and warmth and life come from the sun. If you don't believe in God, it has to. 
That's what gives and sustains life somehow. Um, So the sun god was supposed to be incarnate in Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the representative of the sun god upon the earth. So they put his face on the lion, which is effectively saying that our life and our culture is being guarded by our god and uh, you trespass on our life and our culture at your peril. Now the interesting thing And if you go right back to Samson's day, it's rife. By the way, the Sphinx was uh, was there in Samson's day. It was there hundreds of years before Samson was born. Samson was familiar with a people and a culture who had lions at the doors of their temples, lions at the gates of their city, lions everywhere for their protection, marking out their territory. But these lions were always amazingly associated with riddles. And the purpose of these riddles was um, to baffle anyone who who came to the border of the country or to a door of the temple. And the riddle was designed to be more or less impossible to answer. Uh, When Homer uh, wrote his famous Greek works, the Iliad and the Odyssey, he he has this uh, legend regarding the Sphinx and the, the famous riddle of the Sphinx, what has... Uh, four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening. And anyone who couldn't answer the riddle was supposed to die. Uh, Anyone who answered the riddle had the right to enter the territory. Now, it's a remarkable thing that if you answered correctly, you had access to the land and the Sphinx died. If you didn't answer correctly, The Sphinx itself destroyed you because it was wiser than you. Not just more powerful, but it defeated you with a riddle. Now all these things will cast light on what happens later. When Samson, whose name means the sun, brings his riddle and sets it before the world and asks the world to decipher the riddle. If the world deciphers the riddle, they too will be saved. But if they do not decipher the riddle, they will be destroyed. We'll see that more fully when we come to the riddle. But the lion at the gate, at the door of the temple, or at the edge of the city, is essentially asserting our territory, our power, our pride in our own civilization and in our own wisdom. You can't defeat the Sphinx, you can't defeat the lion. Uh, we, in our wisdom, with our riddles, will defeat you. That's why, by the way, like I say, we'll come to this more fully, but that's why the Philistines had such a sense of shame when they couldn't work out Samson's riddle. You may think to yourself, well, why go to the, the bother of trying to work out the riddle? Why not, why not just say, well, we can't work it out, Samson? There's a reason why they had to work it out. Because they knew that there was a clash of civilizations. There was a clash of belief systems. And they didn't want to be the losers in that contest. We'll say more about that later. So the lion is the guardian of the people and the place. And it combines in itself, with its head and its body, the wisdom and the strength of the culture it protected. So when you confront this lion, you either kill it or you are killed by it. It's a fight to the finish. One will be destroyed. Either Samson is going to be destroyed or the lion is going to be destroyed. But of course there's a deeper symbolism to the lion than that. And it's one you know well. I'm sure you know it all too well. Because in the Bible the devil is persistently brought before us as the lion. As we read in First Peter, the roaring lion, our adversary, Our enemy, and he is that, he's a powerful enemy as we'll see, he is a roaring lion which seeks to devour or to destroy. And this lion that comes against Samson is representing the devil, his assault and his attack. Because the devil wants to guard his own ground and he wants to guard his own territory. He wants to protect worldly culture 
and a worldly civilization because the more worldly it is, the less it carries of the image of God. And the more a place or a person carries of the image of God, the more the devil hates it. It is as simple as that. And as far as the devil is concerned, Egypt is mine, Philistia is mine. And now Timnah is mine. And little by little I will encroach on Israel's supposed territory and I will assimilate all his towns and all his villages to myself. And they will carry my stamp. They will exist as my people and as my culture and my civilization. And the devil's task is effectively to destroy all those who are attempting to invade what he sees as his territory and his land. My nations, my cities, my families, my children, the devil says. The devil says that of all of you. He wants you all to be his families, his children, his people, our councils to be his councils, our governments to be his government, our media to be his media. He wants control of everything. Now that's his task. And uh, sad to say, he never gets tired of it. You wish the devil would take a break. Um, but he just doesn't take a break. The, the word of God tells us, or Peter tells us in his first letter, to be sober, be self-controlled, and be vigilant, he says. Be watching out all the time. Because your adversary, the devil is going about as a roaring lion all the time. So if you slacken your vigilance, if you slacken your sobriety, he's on you like a flash because he knows everything that's going on, more or less, because of the vast intelligence network that he has all over the world. What's his motive? Well, I alluded to this some time ago, but I need to allude to it again in connection with this. His motive, in one way, is very simple. You can reduce it to simple hatred. Just hatred, you could say, pure and simple, or impure and simple. All love is gone out of his heart. The sad thought is that there was love there once. That's really difficult to process. Very, very difficult to understand, but there was love there once. But all that love is gone, and the only thing that remains is hatred. Now, you or I will never have been familiar with somebody who is motivated solely by hate. Sometimes you do come across people, you see interviews with them, um, people who are psychopathic or serial killers or something like that, and you, you detect a, a, an, an awful darkness in these people. You detect it in their eyes, it's in their faces as they speak, it's just evil. But we've, we've never really seen pure hatred, pure hatred. But, but that is what motivates the devil. And it is very simply, like I touched on earlier, it's very simply directed against everyone and anything that carries the image of God. To any degree whatsoever. I suppose you could extend that argument to say that in a strange way he hates himself. But he hates anyone and anything that carries the image of God. It it was said of some pharaohs that when they really wanted to, uh, when they had a particular hatred for uh, a competitor, that, that that they would erase every image that existed of that competitor in the land. That's why you find some pharaohs only coming to light archaeologically because they've literally been buried out of of sight. Their images were defaced. That's the devil's mission. Deface the image of God wherever it's found. That's why he hates all of you. I mean, we needn't be so foolish as to think that the devil loves his own. Sometimes people say that. It's kind of proverbial. Well, the devil loves his own. He does not. He loves no one, no one at all. He's a stranger to the emotion altogether. But as well as being motivated by hatred, 
It's important to recognize that here, in the image of the lion, he is also motivated by fear. Because he doesn't want to lose any ground. And he doesn't want to lose any ground because if he's not the owner of it, the person he hates is the owner of it. Some people you, f- you find fighting over land. and It's amazing how people can fight over land. And the more they hate each other, the more bitter the fight comes. Sometimes over a little sliver of land. I've seen such a thing myself. But he doesn't want to lose any ground to God. And what he really fears is a, a lively church and a liberated church. A powerful church. A, a church that is on its knees. And a church that is on its feet, seeking the glory of God and the extension of his kingdom in this world. He's in fear of that. He hates that. And the fact of the matter is, and I I don't think any of us are as alive to this as we ought to be, there is not a square inch that the devil loses that he doesn't fight to regain. Not a square inch. You find some people in life and they're very tenacious. There's some people playing in a sport and they're very tenacious. You, you know, you just, you just can't defeat them. They're, they're at it all the time. If he loses an inch, he wants it back. That's true of yourself individually. If he feels he's lost you as a person or is in danger of losing you as a person, he'll work hard to get you back. Why? Because for all he knows, you might not be a real believer. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know whether you are in the election of grace or not. One book he has no access to is the book of life. He doesn't doesn't know that. So as far as he's concerned, until you draw your last breath in this world, you're fair game. And he'll fight hard either to expose you as a real hypocrite or else by hurting you as much as possible to make someone else a hypocrite or to make someone else fall away from the faith. Uh, Just think of what a triumph that is for Satan, right? If he can't knock down person A, if he can't keep him out of the kingdom of heaven, well, by hurting person A, he might keep person B out of the kingdom of heaven. And that's good enough for him. Or at least it's good and right in his sight. So he's always wanting the ground back. That's why you you can never sit comfortable with the ground that you've gained. That's true of a society too, and it's true of a church. Satan wants it until it becomes a synagogue of Satan. The Westminster Confession of Faith tells us that a church can backslide so far as to fall away. And it can become a synagogue of Satan, where Satan is quite happy with the place because the gospel It's not really leavening that church itself. Never mind not going out. It's not leavening that church itself. There's no real dynamic power of the truth in that church. It has effectively become a synagogue of Satan. But there's no lost causes as far as Satan is concerned. That's why when Israel were conquering the promised land, uh, at first they fought and they fought well. And then suddenly they stopped. And they start making, started making covenants with the Canaanite people. Uh, just ways in which they could coexist. And that's what the Lord told them not to do. On no account to make covenants with the Canaanites. They, they were to establish treaties and relationships with other nations, but not with the Canaanites. But they started doing that. And little by little, it began to destroy them. So that's why the devil comes all out to protect his territory against what he sees as an aggressor. He's afraid of losing land. And as well as his task and his motive, I want you to notice his method. Now, it's a bit unusual here because normally you see a lion on the offensive. Now, you would say, well, this this lion is on the offensive, but... I'm actually going to argue that he's not really, that he's on the defensive. Um, But normally you see a lion on the offensive. But when you see a lion on the offensive, he's doing things in his own time, in his own way. He's hungry. He hunts at a distance and 
I think I've gone over the process with you before. It's so revealing. Uh, the lion is an intelligent animal, uh, but when he's, when he's originally hunting, uh, he specializes in hiding himself as though he's not interested. Uh, I want you always to remember that. If the animals pick up a scent or think he might be around, he apparently looks the other way as though he, he's not aware of what's going on at all. So he plays dumb. Um, and he hides, he conceals himself. But all the time he's following the pack, his aim is to isolate the prey. Um, once, he sh once he manages to isolate one, he then starts to hunt it down more aggressively until he utterly wearies it. And when he wearies it, he at last moves in for the kill. And the kill is by strangulation. It's interesting that that's how the lion kills in fact, that's what the word sphinx means. Uh, the sphinx, the, the lion with the head of the, of the sun god. Sphinx means to strangle in the Greek language. It's where you get the sphincter muscle. Any muscle in your body that squeezes is the same word as the sphinx. But it strangles you. That's normally how the lion works. In his own way, in his own time, stealthily and intelligently. But you'll notice that that's not how he attacks Samson. There's none of that here. And the reason why he just comes out of nowhere and flies at Samson is because, strangely, he's not on the offensive, he's on the defensive. Let me put that another way. If I was going to ask you, who's the aggressor here with, with Samson and the lion? Who, who's the aggressor? Well, there's a way in which it's complicated because on the one hand you'd say it's the, it's the lion that's the aggressor. He, he's, he's the one who's flying at Samson. The devil is the aggressor. He's the one who's flying at you. But on the other hand, the devil knows that Samson's on a mission. The devil knows that Samson's coming to Timnah for a purpose. The devil knows that Samson's coming to Philistia for a purpose. And the devil would say effectively that Samson is the aggressor. But Samson would effectively turn around and say, ah, yes, but I am here because I wish by the grace of God to end the Philistine occupation and to restore the people of God to their strength and to their life and to their liberty, to awaken them up to their own backslidden condition and their contentment with getting permits from the Philistines for everything that they do. So who's the aggressor? Well, you've just got to wind back. Whose land is it anyway? It's God's land. The earth is the Lord and all the fullness thereof. The original aggressor is always the devil. He has no rights. He has no right to any of the square inches that he's inhabiting. None. He's a squatter. Even as an unconverted person tonight, he's a squatter in your soul. A squatter there. That's the tragedy, that, you, that, that you're allowing the squatter to dictate what happens in your own soul. Have you ever thought of the sadness of that, as well as the evil of it, that you've got a squatter, a squatter in your soul dictating your whole life, and you don't even know it? But he's never more of a squatter than when he plants himself in a covenanted land, in a covenanted town like Timnah, in a covenanted nation like Israel, and can I say in a covenanted nation like Scotland. Yes, we swore ourselves to obedience to God. We did that. Our nobles did it. Our king did it. The people in parliament did it. The common people did it. We swore ourselves to be a land for the Lord and a people for the Lord, a parliament for the Lord, a church for the Lord. But the devil's squatting everywhere. The sad thing is, in Timnah, the people would get used to it because, well, because that's the way it goes. Uh, especially if you stop fighting against something. 
you you just get used to it and you think that this is the way it's supposed to be and so satan prowls around the territory that is gained and he guards it prowls around the media prowls around the education of our children prowls around too many congregations prowls around national churches prowls around our city borders prowls around our national borders and says stay away this is my land and really you have to say this that in a covenanted land it's the sleepiness of the church that explains the devil's occupation of the land there's no way in a covenanted nation that the devil could ever get to occupy the ground unless the church had fallen fast asleep And the only way the church falls fast asleep is by being self-indulgent and complacent. Lax, careless, sleepy and backslidden. That's how the devil gets into your soul. That's how the devil gets into your family. That's how the devil or can get into your family. That's how the devil gets into congregations, churches and nations. Because the church is asleep. Beware, the Lord said to Israel when she was going into Canaan. You're going in to live in houses that you never built. I'm giving them to you. You're going to enjoy the fruits of vineyards that you never planted. Uh, I'm actually going to bring you into a land that is just ready to occupy with milk and honey uh, because of my kindness and grace towards you. But beware when your bellies are full that you do not forget the Lord your God. Personally, I think a full belly is far more dangerous than an empty one. I think wealth is far more dangerous than poverty. And one of the reasons for the complacency of the church is that we've had things too good. Too good. And maybe the Lord will change that. But the devil knows Samson is on a mission. Now you may say, well how does the devil know that? I mean if you take this lion not only as representing the devil but effectively as being let loose by the devil this is a devilish assault how does the devil know? Well the way in which he knows so much. Uh, Remember that he does have an intelligence service all over the world. Does he not know a lot about you? Of course he does. He knows a lot about you. He knows a lot about me. He knows my weak points. He knows what I may think my strong points are, but which he might have worked out are actually fairly weak. He watched Christ visiting Manoah and announcing the birth of this child. He heard the words that Christ spoke to Manoah. He's been watching this child growing, his development, his extraordinary spirituality. He's watched it all. You remember how God uh, said to Satan, "Uh, where have you been? And Satan says, I've been going to and fro over the face of the whole earth. He's either doing it personally or through his representatives. Have you seen my servant Job? God says. Oh yes, he says. Of course I've seen your servant, Job. Have you seen that there is no one like him on the face of the earth? God said. Oh yes, the devil said. I know that. But change his circumstances and he'll curse you to his face. And we'll soon see what he's made of. Why don't you give me permission? Uh, Just let it be a test. Let it be a test in heaven. Let it be a test upon the earth. Let me at him and let's see what he's like. Well, it's effectively the case too. Have you seen my servant Samson? Oh, yes, I have. How do you feel about Samson going near your territory? Don't like it. Don't like it. He saw the spirit moving upon him at Mahanedan between Eshtol and Sor. His eyes on him. His eyes on him. There's no doubt that the devil, uh, can I say it? Um, I don't know how exactly to say it, but... He's more concerned with some than others. 
for particular reasons. Maybe I'll come to that in a moment. But when he sees Samson move, he he can he, he doesn't just see the obedience, but he can he can smell the courage, the zeal that is allied with love in Samson's heart, and he doesn't want this man near Timnah. He's coming into his territory. He's coming into his territory to reclaim it for God. And that's why he goes for him. He goes for the jugular. There's no messing about. There's no prowling around for a while. It's just straight at him. To choke him to death. To make him fall. This is my town, Samson. My culture, my government, my weapons, my generation and my children. Now, in connection with that, friends, don't be surprised if the devil comes at you when you try to do good. Um, When you're fast asleep, the devil doesn't really trouble you much because he doesn't have to. But when you really resolve to do good and... Even perhaps you wake up in the morning or even perhaps you can go home on the Sabbath and you say, well, I'm going to turn things around here. I'm not just, I'm not just going to sit in my situation or whatever and just do nothing and carry on every day in the same way I'm going to do something. The devil will come in at you right away. And the moment you try, suppose, suppose you even decide to write a letter to somebody about something, or, or you try and speak to somebody who, who's maybe doing something that they ought not to be doing, or something like that, out he flies at you right away because you're encroaching his territory. He won't slither around you like a serpent. He'll just try to strangle you to death like a lion. We know he slithers around sometimes like a serpent, but sometimes he's like a lion. The other thing is if, it's an old saying I suppose, but if the devil doesn't bother you, it's probably because you don't bother him. He doesn't need to bother people who don't bother himself. As long as you accept that he sharpens your tools and he's in charge of all your weapons, if you accept him issuing permits for what you can and can't do, he's, that's all right, on you go, go your own way. He's at least suspicious that the image of God upon you might not be all that real after all. And let me say too that the person that troubles um, the devil the least is also the person that prays the least. And the person that troubles him the most is the person that prays the most. I can't remember which Puritan it was who said that the devil trembles most when he sees a saint on his knees, but I believe that that is absolutely true. He trembles when he sees a saint on his knees or on her knees, because a person like that is a person who's determined to be what the Lord wants them to be. Well, they're first and foremost. I mean, if we're on our knees, we're first and foremost saying that we can't be anything ourselves. That's why we're on our knees. Self-reliant people are never on their knees because they don't need to be. It doesn't, they can talk about Christianity all day long, but if they don't pray, they are basically self-reliant and self-sufficient. And I sometimes fear, I don't know, but I sometimes fear that churches are full of such people. But if we are on our knees, we've recognized that we've nothing but that God is the source of the strength and of our help. And that's when the devil wakes up and is concerned about you. Absolutely, he'll come at you. And although this is a serious challenge for Samson, I want you to recognize right away that God's purpose in letting the lion loose here is not to kill him. It looks awful to know that you're confronted with a a beast that's 15 feet long and weighs about 240 kilograms and has teeth and claws like we saw. But it's not God's purpose to kill Samson. He's as well recognizing how brutish and forceful and fearful the devil is, but it's not God's purpose to destroy him. 
In fact, it's God's purpose to encourage him. Because by defeating this lion, he's going to be able to get inside Timnah with the confidence of knowing that however hard the difficulties he's going to meet through an unfaithful wife and constant betrayals in his life, the Lord will be with him. And the Lord will uphold him. And the Lord will strengthen him. And that's why he gets this victory right away. After all, his name is Samson. His name is connected with the Son. And he's representing the Son of Righteousness, who's going to bring healing in his wings to his own country, who's going to bring the true light and the true warmth of the gospel, which Samson will present in a riddle first, if they're willing to take it and willing to receive it. But he represents the true Son of God. And, of course, he will prevail even though he's got no weapons well he can't have any weapons Philistines got all the weapons remember you need a permit and they're not going to give you permits to get a weapon but Samson doesn't need worldly weapons neither do you neither do I he's not going to fight lies with lies or intrigue with intrigue he's not going to he's not going to bully people like like the Philistines do He has a special weapon. That weapon, of course, is his strength. Now, of course, his strength is superhuman. I mean that literally. It is more than human strength. It's a strength that God gave him. And you'll notice that it's intimately connected with the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life. As long as he's dependent on the Holy Spirit, that strength remains. But the minute he himself cuts the tie with the Holy Spirit, that strength disappears. This strength isn't, ju- isn't just a natural strength. I'm not saying that he wasn't naturally strong. I mean, normally God gifts us um, as Christians by taking gifts that he's given us naturally and enhancing them. Although he's free to impart something that wasn't there before at all. But normally he takes something that he gave you originally. It's not your own. None of us have anything, something he chose to give you, perhaps from birth, and he refines it and brings it on and sanctifies it. But Samson's strength uh, doesn't mean that he was a, a wall of rippling muscles or anything like that, that you would recognize him walking down the street as the strongest person in the world. No. It was something that came upon him when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Because it was a special gift that God imparted of extraordinary physical strength when the need for that arose. Just when the need for it arose. It's a gift. Special gift from God. And it's important that you see his strength like that because his strength functions as a picture of the strength that's ours too if we live in dependence upon the Lord. The physical strength that God gave him is a picture of the spiritual strength that God imparts to his people. Superhuman. You are able to do what you could not do before just because the Spirit of the Lord indwells you, giving a wisdom you didn't have giving you truth that you didn't know, giving you spiritual power that you never possessed yourself. He gives you power to resist evil, to do the good, to be cheerful in the midst of difficult circumstances, to be, in other words, a strong Christian rather than a weak one. Now, friends, I don't know, but I feel most of us are weak Christians. I'm... Maybe I should speak more generally because there are certainly strong Christians here as far as I can see. But today, in general, Christians, even true Christians, I believe, are weak. Paul called us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Different words, different Greek words, all meaning strength. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. These are three different Greek words. He's he's giving us this image of being really strong. 
Let the strength that belongs to God, he says, indwell you so that you are able to be a mature man and woman in Christ Jesus, strong in what you believe, strong in acting it out, strong in witnessing on Christ's side, strong in doing the good and strong in resisting the evil, not children tossed to and fro with doctrines and fashions as everything, and in everything else. How do you do that? Well, put on the armour, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. Put these on. And that's, why, that's what's symbolised effectively by nothing being in Samson's hand. The lesson being taught is you don't, you don't need that stuff. E.M. Uh, e. Bounds, in his, one of his works on prayer, said it a long time ago, that the church is obsessed with better strategies God wants better men and women. Churches are obsessed with strategies God wants, with better strategies, God wants better men and better women. He has nothing in his hand. He's only got a reliance upon God who comes upon him and who helps him. The way that he uh, kills the animal and then what happens with the animal is quite an astonishing thing which will take us to the riddle, God willing, next time. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, uh, teach us our own weakness and uh, teach us your strength. Enable us to know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And help us never to be content with being in a lukewarm spiritual condition. Give us rather to be hot or cold, water that is of use and not water that is spewed out by the Lord's own mouth. O deliver us from sloth and carelessness and help us to remember that with God for us, who can be against us? In the precious name of Christ, O Lord. Amen.